Jim Rooker, this is Bob Lazeri, Tony D'Angelo in Eastern Connecticut. Thanks for joining us tonight, Jim. Hi, Rook. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's, it's our, it's our pleasure, pleasure, and I will uh, speak for Tony that you've been one of the more cooperative uh, guests in the booking process. Nothing against your peers, but you probably <laughs> being in the media has a lot to do with that, uh, with the cooperation. <laughs> we're, we're genuinely touched, Jim. We really are. So we thank you for that. Uh, just, just some background on Jim for our, uh, our consumers out there watching while we, uh, we get uh, this all in order. Uh, Jim, Tony, uh, born in Lakeview, Oregon, signed by the Tigers as an amateur free agent back in 1960. Lifetime won 103 games in the major leagues with a respectable 3.46 ERA, pitched over 1,800 innings, good innings to hit ratio, 66 complete games, 319 games in all, uh, pitched close to 20 postseason innings with an ERA of 3.2, and played for three different teams between 1968 and and 1980 and uh, Jim let me just we'll fire some questions at you like we normally do and again it's a pleasure having you here and what we always normally used used to talk uh, to our ex-players about is where they grew up and who they followed now born in Oregon tell us what team you followed Jim and maybe some of your favorite players back then well actually <clears throat> I was born in Oregon and, and but did not spend much time my, my father and mother at the time, uh, they were welders, and they were up in Oregon uh, doing a, doing work up there. So I happened to be born up there, but then we got quickly, we moved down to uh, back down to Southern California. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So growing up, basically, I grew up in Southern California uh, until the, the late 60s. So I grew up uh, really a, a Yankee fan because we didn't have Major League Baseball until the Dodgers came out there. And and so I grew up a New York Yankee fan, and I know this might rub you guys a little bit because where you're from. But uh, the, when the Dodgers came into L.A., then I kind of uh, you know followed them, and it was it was actually easy for me to follow them because listening to Vin Scully do a baseball game day after day after day, you can't help but be a Dodger fan. Right. Mm -hmm. And we still do, Jim. Sometimes uh, Tony and I on the weekend will, will get the stream of uh, Scully, and he sounds the same as he ever did. It, it's so heartwarming. And it just makes you think of, like, years years gone by. It's really something. It really is. It, and uh, Yeah, we miss guys like that. You know, yes. I mean, you think of the guys that have gone, the Harry Carries, the, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and others uh, that were just kind of, uh, even Bob Prince in Pittsburgh and, in the Lindsey Nelsons and guys like mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot of people probably don't know or remember some of these guys, but they, I grew up listening to all those guys, and it was great. Made me a bigger fan, and luckily became a player. And as we talk to Jim Rooker, we have a nice collage of his career, some still pictures that we will show um, uh, frequently during our interview here. And, Jim, we've... Uh, the 68 Tigers, where you all started, you know, you spent some time in the minors in the system, and we've had Gates Brown on the show. In fact, we've had three people on the show that were ex-teammates of yours at one time or another. We've had Gates Brown, Dick Drago, and uh, who was the other one, Tony? It was um, two, two, Mike Eastler. Mike Eastler. Those three. But uh, the 68 Tigers, Jim, uh, that team, uh, full of characters, you weren't there very long, but I'm sure you've had some very special memories of a very what, special team. What was it like to arrive in that clubhouse? <laughs> well, first of all, the thing that the, the toughest thing for me was the manager Mayo Smith because I had had a I had had quite a season the year before in AAA, and there were three left-handers that were pretty much uh, going after two jobs in spring training. It was myself, a guy named John Warden, and a guy named Les Kane. Mm -hmm. I had been. Uh, pitching in AAA the year before, like I said, had a great year. Uh, those other two guys were in A ball, and and for whatever reason, to this day, and I mean, it's always been a rub for me and kind of not uh, not a happy one, is the fact that he took those two guys over me in spring training, which I'll never understand to this day. And mm. as it turns out, neither one of them did much. And I eventually was drafted by Kansas City after going up and down in the Tiger organization. Uh, well, actually, the next year when they had the expansion in '69, went to Kansas City. But it was it was a great clubhouse because you had guys like Al Kaline, uh, Norm Cash, who was really 
more of a leader on that team than people understand. Uh, he was such a funny guy and always had a way of keeping guys loose. Uh, uh, you know, Al Kaline was Al Kaline, the great player that he was, the Hall of Famer. But Cash was more outspoken and funny, so the, I think guys related to him a little bit more. And, of course, you had all around that, that field, everybody on the team, I mean, great players and freehand and, <clears throat> excuse me, the outfield, Mickey Stanley and Jim Northrup, Willie Horton, K-Line, and, mm. you know, I mean, just, a, and, of course, the pitching staff, Denny McLean, whom I roomed with in, in the minor leagues for a year. That was an experience. <laughs> you you and, lived. And, and we, yeah, and I lived. And, and you know what? Denny and I still talk. I call him occasionally, uh, and and uh, you just wonder when the hammer's going to fall again because he <laughs> seems to keep getting in trouble all yeah. the time. But he was, mm. uh, I, I, it was Mickey Lolich. We talked to Gates Brown about yeah. the, the very same things, uh, Jim. And but uh, how good? Uh, that was my question. How good was McLean that year? How can you tell I, our I, I uh, our viewers? Uh, Thirty-one wins, but how good was he that year? <laughs> well, just think of a pitcher that if if your team didn't give you maybe one run, he'd go out and win one to nothing. If if mm. if they give you four or five runs, he might win five to four, four to three. But, I mean, his ERA that year was still under two. I think it was 197 or something like that when he won the 31 games. A lot of guys think that his ERA was way up there, but it wasn't. I mean, this guy, when he had to get you out, he got you out. He was, And, and when, when he needed a run, it just seemed like the team rallied for him and would score the run. So it was a combination of things because it's obviously uh, not too many guys can, can go out there and win 30-plus games. So he was phenomenal. He was he was in, incredible that year. That's uh, about all you can say. It uh, we think about McLean, Tony. We smile him playing the organ. Mm. We think about yeah. the 31 wins. It's just amazing. In the, in, in the multiple Pepsis again. <laughs> oh yeah. Again. Well, when I roomed with him, I I've never I, I can didn't quite understand it myself. I mean, we were both real young in Duluth, Minnesota. This was in 1963. Mm. And uh, I, I'd never, ever seen a guy in the morning. He wouldn't, you don't get up and brush your teeth. You get up and, and drink Pepsi. <laughs> the next day, he would, you know, I'm serious. He'd go through a minimum, uh, almost anywhere from a half a case to a case of Pepsi per day. Per day. I don't know. I just don't know how he did it. But that was his thing. Uh, worked. It worked for him at least that year. Uh, well, a little, a few years later, we should yeah. say. But that is funny, Jim. That's again, folks that are watching MNST tonight. We're on the picture uh, on the phone with former Major League pitcher Jim Rooker. Tony, question and for Jim. Rook, it's just such a great honor to have you, and I'm just enjoying this tremendously. You leave Kansas City in '60. I'm, I'm sorry. You leave Detroit in '68. You go to Kansas City, and uh, I, I mean, I look at those early Royal teams, and like you know, my when I think of the early Royals, I think of Freddie Patek crying on the bench after losing the playoff series. And I think of Pinella busting his butt, you know, out of every play. And, I mean, was that like, um, you know, what was the mindset in Kansas City? Like, we're really going to do something here? Or when you got there, it was like, wow, I've been expanded. Well, I, honestly, the, the first year in 69, I think we surprised a lot of people. I think we finished third that year. And we, we still had players that were young trying to find their way. And I was one of them. I had a terrible year pitching that year. Uh, but uh, we, we really did have a <laughs> – if you, you, know, you talk about clubhouses, again, my roommate in Kansas City for the, that year was Lou Pinella. So I've had some great roommates and, and fun years, uh, you know. But uh, it was a team that – you know, once we kind of got everybody's attention, it, it wasn't as easy the next year or the next year after that because they, they were kind of paying attention to us. We had pretty good pitching. That's the way Kansas City drafted. Uh, they drafted young pitchers, and we had a really, really good pitching staff and a guy named Mo Drabowski who was kind of like the guy that was our father. He, We kind of watched how Mo did things, how he worked, how he you know, got in his work, how he ran, how he – how he uh, approached the game. So that was a big help to us because, uh, we, like I say, we were still trying to find our way as expansion players. There were some, a couple of other uh, guys that have been around that, that, that had uh, a lot of years. Jerry Adair at second base was one that, that helped the infielders. And then Cookie Rojas came along. And when you mentioned Freddie Patek, 
watching Cookie Rojas at second base and Freddie at short, the double plays they turned still amazed me. We even there would be times when a ball would be hit in the infield where we would say, "They're not going to turn this one. It's it's not going to happen." And somehow they would get it done. Mm. So Cookie was quite an influence on Freddie, uh, made him a much better shortstop uh, because of Cookie's experience at second base. And I should tell our viewers that the four years that Jim was in Kansas City, there were, so, there were some very, very memorable moments, Tony. We were sure. talking before the telecast, Jim, the, uh, the, the first Royal to hit two home runs in a game was you. Yeah, isn't that amazing? <laughs> and you did you know it off Jim Cott. That, to me, yeah. I just came across that today, and I said, Mike, there's a trivia question That's a, for yeah. you. Nobody would ever guess that. Never. Nobody would ever guess that. No. And the thing that surprises me, now I'd, I'd, I'd ask you this question. If you, if, if you look in the, in the Boston Media Guide, and they always usually in Media Guides, you know, the organization's first, whatever they were, sure. the first hit, the first this, the first that. And if there's a section in there, what player was the first player to hit two home runs in one game? Now, I think a lot of teams have that in there. And I don't know if it was because a pitcher did it in Kansas City. They never list that. And I always thought it belonged in the media guys, but it's not in there. <laughs> we do too, Jim. <laughs> that really surprised me. And when we did some research, Tony and I were on the computer just before we came on. You hit 200 as a pitcher in your career with, I believe, seven home runs. Two of them in that game off Jim Cott. That is just amazing. And then, of course, 1970, Jim, you went into a game with a no-hitter in the ninth inning. Horace Clark of the Yankees breaks it up, and you guys lose in extra innings. But, uh, my goodness, what's the feeling like of going into the ninth with a no-hitter? At least you can Well, it was in yeah. the Yankee Stadium, you know, wow. of all places. And, and uh, <clears throat> that was my first start ever in Yankee Stadium. So I'm warming up in the bullpen, and I had electric stuff, believe me. I mean, it was just exploding. The only problem was in the bullpen, I couldn't throw the ball over the plate. I'll tell you, it was going everywhere but in the strike zone. So wow. I get I get down uh, to the, you know, the, the bottom of the first inning pitching against the Yankees, and I can't remember the lineup, although I do remember Horace Clark was their leadoff guy. Mm -hmm. And I think Mercer was batting second. But I think I walked him and then a, and an error and then another walk. I have bases loaded and nobody out. And I strike out the next guy, I believe, or pop up, and then they ground into a double play. So I get out of the first inning with no hits. Now I go all the way to the bottom of the ninth. It's one to nothing, and and I'm uh, still got a no hitter going against the Yankees. Well, Horace Clark hits the first pitch for a base hit. Mm -hmm. Mercer doubles, and then I give up one inning to tie it, and then in, I lose it in the twelfth, two to one on a sacrifice fly. <laughs> <laughs> the thought of leaving a pitcher in a game for 12 innings is unbelievable. Yeah, that's, <laughs> we talk about a different era, but what a story. It's just an amazing uh, – those were two very, very memorable moments. Again, we're on the phone with former MLB pitcher Jim Rooker, and as we go chronologically here, Tony, we're in Pittsburgh now in 73. Um, Jim, you get three straight seasons with ERAs under three. You win an impressive 29 games in 76 and 77. Combined, you just seem to blossom as a pitcher in Pittsburgh. Do you think it was? Well, you said you, you kind of cut your teeth as an, in an expansion team. But was it a new league? Was it the the better offense, Danny Murtaugh, I, or was it a combination of things? Well, a combination of things. And actually, when I left Kansas City, when they, I was still property of Kansas City in the winter of '72, and uh, I was down in Venezuela. And I just started messing around on my own, throwing a sinker ball with the other stuff. I always had a live arm. I could throw in the mid to upper 90s. But I was just wild, and I was inconsistent. But when I had my stuff, I, I could win. Yeah. But you just didn't know what, what you were going to get on a given day, and I, was, I just wasn't consistent. So I decide, when I'm in winter ball, to start messing around with a sinker, and, and um, when I mean a sinker, not a, a slow, but a power sinker, kind of like a, uh, I don't know, what's he's Rob Lowe. In fact, he's pitching for the Yankees tonight, I think, in relief. Derek Lowe, Derek yes. Lowe, yes. De Derek Lowe, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, right. kind of like that, a, a, really a, a diving sinker with, with some good velocity. So I pick that up in Venezuela oh. and find out I get traded to the Pirates and go to spring training, and I start using that pitch more and more. 
the first two and a half months of the season, Bill Verdon was the manager at first there when I got there in 73, and then Murtaugh came back. But mm-hmm. uh, he put me in the bullpen, and I was I was kind of like the seventh or eighth inning guy. And he it seemed like I, he put me in the worst jams of all, and I just wasn't giving up anything. I just kept getting guys out, getting guys out. And ultimately, because Steve Blass lost his control, right. and Verdon had tried everybody else to, to in the starting uh, to get that starter job, ultimately he gave he finally I'm the last guy he tries. The first start I make, I get raked by the Cardinals, and I figure that's not going to happen with me. Then I'm going to stay in the bullpen, but he lets me start one more game. Now this is in middle of June. Mm-hmm. And uh, he lets me start another game, and I beat Montreal, and then I'm in the starting rotation through, for the rest of my career there. And I end up winning 10 games for, for the Pirates in that, in, from June on. So uh, that kind of set the table for me, got me established to a degree, and, and I just you know kind of through a five-year period there, I won – Five years in a row, double figures, which was you know pretty good, yeah. Yeah. considering what I had done in, you know previously to that. It sure was, and the numbers were pretty impressive. The ERAs again, three straight years, 73, 74, 75 ERAs under three. Tony, question. And uh, you know, Rick, as far as like getting over to the Pirates in '73, I think of two things. You had mentioned Steve Blass, and I also think of uh, this is the year after Roberto Clemente passed on. Was that an odd time to come into Pittsburgh for you? Or yeah, for- it really was because I was in Venezuela again in winter ball when that happened, when he went down in that plane crash. So, with all of my anticipation after being traded, I thought. You know, I mean, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Sure. Roberto Clemente, Willie Stargell, Al Oliver, and, and all these other guys pounding the ball all over the place. If you can pitch five or six innings, seven innings, you're going to win 90% of the yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I I, I, uh, I thought it would have been a tremendous thing, but then Clemente dies in that accident, so I go to spring training, and there's still, you know, there's still a lot of guys kind of looking around. How's you know? There's obviously there's something missing. Mm-hmm. Some clubs, when when they go into and have problems, they can't figure out what's missing. Well, in this case, it was so obvious. It was Roberto Clemente, and who was gonna who was gonna take his place? Well, nobody. You you don't replace someone like that. And and uh, you know because of the relationship Manny Sanguin had with. Clemente, they started the season with Sanguin and Wright, which was a total disaster. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was it was actually comical, and they got him out of right field real quick and back behind the plate. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, it, in Pittsburgh, you know, for a while, you couldn't really go anywhere or do anything with, without anybody mentioning, you know, the loss of Clemente and how it was affecting the team. I think as players on the field, once we started the games and playing, you know, we went out there and did our job, but it was it was away from the field or, you know, moments where there wasn't anything going on that, you know, Clemente's name might come up. And so, it and it, you know what, it still does in Pittsburgh at times because they still honor the guy and they should, but it, it, it was a, it was a you know, I mean, think Same. about tragic losses, uh, you know, in baseball and, and, and what's happened when people pass on. I mean, even, you know, with Johnny Pesky today, what's mm-hmm. happened, you know, people, you start thinking about, uh, you know, remembering, you know, all the good times and, and what a person meant to an organization. So it's it's just something that happens, you know, and you just ultimately in time you'll get through it. Yeah, we mm-hmm. are uh, dedicating this show, I should tell our viewers, Tony, to Mr. Pesky. To Mr. We Pesky. will show a still photo of him at the end. Uh, Jim Rooker goes on to pitch in the NLCS, Tony, in 74-75. Yes. Chuck Tanner becomes the Pirates manager in 77 Jim, we were always under the impression uh, that he was a player's manager. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Chuck is the kind of guy. Especially, especially with a veteran team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what we had. Chuck just kind of stayed back. And he, he, had, he always said, you know, I keep one eye, ear, one eye uh, and one ear open. And, and the other, you know, the other half. So, in other words, he's just saying, you know, I'm going to step back. You guys do your job, and I'm not going to bother you. But when you stop doing your job and, some, and you know, you, you take advantage of a guy, and you don't want to get Chuck Tanner mad at you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't want to be on his, his list or in his – and he didn't have a doghouse. I mean, he'd get he, – he would straighten you up real quick. And, and, uh, but he had a classy way of doing it. He always stuck up for his players. Everybody loved him. 
I mean, Chuck Chuck was a, 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 a terrific manager, and he was a he was a he was a fighter. I mean, this guy came from hard working days in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and and he was strong and mean and tough, but he you wouldn't know it. I mean, he was just so easy going with people, unless you know you got on his wrong side, but. Like I said, he didn't have a doghouse. He would just get whatever whatever the problem was. He'd get it straightened out, and then you just move on. Well, that's uh, that's the player's manager, and he was a very good one, and had oh, done yeah. the same thing in Chicago, Tony, with the Dick yes, Allen's uh, yeah. back back before that. But uh, again, uh, just a couple minutes left, Tony, with Mr. Rooker's question. And uh, you know, Rook, you. Uh, you left baseball, and uh, did you proceed immediately to the broadcast booth, or were there some other things that you maybe were considering at the time? No, I, I was lucky. They had an opening, and, and you know, I'm I kind of a guy that ran his mouth a little bit, and I think that kind of helped me to some degree. <laughs> so uh, that that got me in the booth, and then I stayed there quite a few years with the Pirates, and uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it. It was great to still be in baseball. And then I, I also owned a restaurant at the time up there. In fact, I just sold it last October. Uh -huh. And and then, uh, you know, ultimately, the, the, the last thing, the latest thing, and I hope we have time to just quickly mention, I wrote these three children's books. Oh, we yes. will. We will. That, uh, that I'm, I'm really proud of those because in baseball, I grew up with baseball. I, you know, I, I just wanted to be a ball player. But when I decided to write these three children's books, uh, it was because of my grandkids, and you don't practice. I don't have the pedigree to be a writer, but I had the mentality of probably an eight-year-old to to write cute little three little books, Paul the Baseball, Map the Bat, and Kit the Mitt, and they're just little short stories that rhyme, and they're so easily read and readable for children that are le learning to read. And, you know, I mean, kids in baseball, how can you go wrong with that when it comes yeah. to a Sure. A little book, and the, and the, the kids to Mint, by the way, is is for little girls. I wrote that one for girls. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and mascotbooks.com, dot com. Mm -hmm. There, the, that's how you can order them. Or people that are interested in them, and 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 also, if you want to follow me, or uh, here's here's how far behind I am in the technical world. Just two weeks ago, I finally got a phone that I can tweet with. I'm getting into the social media to try and and, yeah. and and market these books too, but I, I don't you got you talk about someone that is behind the time. So anybody that wants to talk to me, they can go uh, J Rooker nineteen, the number nineteen, mm -hmm. and and contact me that way and, and we can talk. And and uh, I'm having a ball with this. I mean I, I I follow the pirates still and I try to talk to people, you know, involved with the pirates and that sort of stuff. So um it's it's been rewarding. It, it it's been a lot of fun for me. And those books, Tony, were published in 2009 uh, by Mascot. I would like to ask Rook about yeah. the intentional walk. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And sure. If Rook, it's, go ahead. Uh, if uh, me. if we lose this game, I'm walking home. Is that a true well, story? Well, <laughs> listen, I've been in baseball since 1960 when I signed out of high school, and now during a game in Philadelphia. We had lost every game on the road trip, and this was the very last game <laughs> of the trip. And we, we scored 10 runs in the top of the first inning in Philly. And I simply said, well, if you're only going to win one game, why not make it the last one because it's a nicer ride home? In fact, if we lose, I'll walk home. It was just simply that said that way. And you never think, and that's, in all the years I've been in baseball, I've never been on a team that's been ahead by 10 runs and lost or been behind by 10 runs and come back and win a game. So mm -hmm. I didn't say it, uh, you know, thinking that any yeah. that, that it was going to be a challenge of any kind. Obvious. I just thought it was a normal thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it uh, of course, we lost 15 to 11 at the end of the year. I, I flew back to Philadelphia with a friend of mine, and he walked every step of the way. Thirteen days it took us, but we raised eighty-one thousand dollars for Children's Hospital, and uh, that was the rewarding part. But I still have a left ankle that bothers me today because of that. <laughs> well, it was a good cause, and and I can't 
I can't end the show without just uh, re revisiting just for a second, Jim, that 79 magical season. Yeah, you you do have a World watch. Series ring, the We Are Family thing, and yeah, Willie yeah, Stargell you know. was, and the whole, just maybe a couple of lines about that because we remember it well. It was just an amazing uh, a, a stint for everybody involved in yes. Pittsburgh baseball. Well, think about guys that you've been around in baseball that are the nicest model citizens, just wonderful human beings, period. Well, that's Willie Stargell. And you have him on every ball club. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're out there. But uh, Willie was in that, that, that category. Uh, he was, you learn so much from the guy. He had, for a big guy, I, and I only saw him mad one time, Tug McGraw threw a pitch and hit him in the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And Willie just walked about two or three steps out in front of the plate and pointed at McGraw and said, don't ever, ever throw at me again. And he didn't, he didn't yell or scream, and Willie just trotted down to first base. But he was he, he was such a affable, laughable teddy bear. You could say anything to this guy. Of course, if you did it public today, the media would go crazy with it. But back then, we would say stuff in our clubhouse that you just you couldn't put in the paper. Of course, mm -hmm. but Willie Willie would just laugh the hardest about anything that, that was said that, that might even be a little bit off-color. But, uh, you know, the, he, he was such a leader by example, and that's, that's the whole thing. Willie wasn't a rah-rah guy. He, he, if he held a, a team meeting, basically all he would say would, hey, guys, we just need to go out and play baseball. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any, any special formula. He said, let's just go out and play some pirate baseball. Yeah, he led that's by all. example. Kept it as simple as you can be. Yeah. Simple, and I guess that's why they called him Pops, right, Jim? And that's he, right. That's it was right. effective, and what kind of postseason he had was beyond. Uh, well, it was, it we, was just great memories of watching you guys. It really was. And, Jim, um, our time is just about up. And, uh, again, we want to thank you. Uh, we'll be following you on the Internet. We'll make sure uh, the word gets out there. And, again, I want to thank you for all your cooperation uh, prior really to the show. Pleasure, and it's been a uh, an immense pleasure talking with yourself, and please keep in touch, and our best to your family also. Okay, thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so Anytime, much. Anytime, Jim. Sir. Thank you. Good night.